chapter 12 of ECE 2305. So in this lecture, and it's going to be a rather short lecture, but it's conceptually, it's, it's a fantastic lecture. We're going to continue on with our discussion about linked layer. Okay? So we saw in the last class, what's the responsibility of linked layer? Is to make sure that we're able to, first of all, handle multiple users. So multiple communications to a node from other nodes, okay, so manage the medium or medium access, and once we receive information that's packaged in a frame, to be able to extract information from it, but very importantly, to determine whether an error has occurred, and if an error has occurred, to correct for it. So most of the techniques that we saw in Lecture 11 uh, focus on, in particular, things to indicate that an error have occurred. We actually did not look at techniques to sort of clean up the mess once we've detected successfully that an error did indeed is present. So we looked at the parity check, we looked at checksum, and we looked at CRC, right, as three different techniques. What we're going to be looking at today um, relates more to the first part that we, we kind of looked at a little bit, but I want to go into more detail, which is medium access. And so you're gonna, we're going to look at two different ways of doing medium access. So Wi-Fi, for instance, how it works is very different to how cellular communications work. It's like night and day. So we're going to look at something that's much more regimented and then something that's very ad hoc, very contention-based. All right? So what we're going to be looking at is, first of all, how we support multiple users accessing the same node, the same device. And, and the protocols behind it. And we're, in particular, we're going to look at channel partitioning. This is your TDMA, FDMA, CDMA. And we're going to look at random access. And that's something more like Wi-Fi, as opposed to this guy, which is more like a cellular network. Okay. So this is what, what we're really interested in. We want to avoid some sort of collision, because when collisions happen with transmissions, everyone loses. And so that's where multiple access protocols kick in. So let, let me draw you guys what I mean. So what happens is if I have a radio here, let's say that's radio 1. This is radio 2. And this is radio 3. So suppose. Two transmits to one, and three also transmits to one. And they both do it at the same time, t equals t1. What we've got is a collision. All right? What happens is if we have these two different signals basically being intercepted at the same time by one, they're being broadcast at the same time on the same frequency. What ends up happening is we can't hear anything. Basically, they're walking on top of each other. No two radios can talk to the same destination at the exact same time on the exact same frequency. And we're assuming that there's no code, OK? There's no spreading that we talked about a few days ago. So as a result, um, one can't pick up anything. They're jamming each other. So this collision means that. 2 and 3 are jamming. Okay, So what is jamming? So jamming is like you probably have seen maybe some military films or perhaps Star Trek, right? Like the Romulans are jamming our frequencies, Captain. You know, and then, uh, you know, or uh, the Borg, oh, my favorite, right? But w what the concept of jamming is, is you introduce some sort of interference. It could be there's a variety of different jammers, right? So this is an aside, but it's a cool aside. So there are two types of jammers. So there are wideband jammers, and there are narrowband jammers. And what, what do these mean? So what happens is the wideband jammer, it's like saying, here's a big chunk of frequency. I'm going to radiate everything no one's going to be able to communicate. If there is a signal there, you will not be able to decode it. You're basically, what you're doing is, you're scorching the Earth in terms of the frequency band. No one will be able to use it. 
Narrow band jammer is more like a sniper of a jammer. It's like, I know where that signal is. It's at this specific frequency. I'm going to irradiate, I'm going to transmit in that frequency, that narrow band uh, range, and then everyone else is good. So this would work, and this has been considered. Like, let's say you're in a cellular network, or let's say you're in a Wi-Fi network, and you know which signal. Let, let's say there's a guy that you don't like, right? Or, yeah, let's, let's say there's a person, Bob, right? And you don't like Bob but you want all your friends to communicate instead over the air. What do you do? Use a narrowband jammer. You just put a lot of energy over Bob's signal. And unless Bob is able to hop away, um, Bob won't be able to communicate. That link is dead. But everyone else is permitted to talk to each other. There's no Bobs in here, is it? No. OK, no, don't raise hands. Anyone call Bob, don't raise hands. But what, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to put anyone on the spot. Yeah, yes, professor, you know. So. <laughs> But, but the concept is, whereas let's say you have a bunch of signals, so let's say that's a signal, that's a signal, that's a signal, that's a signal. So narrowband jammer means I'm going to, let's say, irradiate this guy such that the, the receiver cannot decode him, while a, a, a wideband jammer does this. It basically will irradiate the entire range of frequencies in order to prevent anyone from transmitting across that band. Yes? It, well, within, within reason. So let's say on the order of tens of megahertz. Okay. So, so uh, narrow band is like really one signal, like relative to one. Where wide band could be the entire operational band of a, a range of wireless applications. Yeah, like if you have a jammer that's like on the order of gigahertz, that's, that's quite serious. <laughs> and the amount of energy to do that is, is ginormous. Like I think many years ago, I remember I did this... Um, this open house, I forgot where it was, oh, Industry Canada. So they have this research facility, and they were looking into ways of, of counteracting wideband jammers. So this was a time, I think they were coming out of, um, so there was a military conflict in uh, the former Yugoslavia. They had a lot of Canadian soldiers there, and they needed ways to um, um, sort of fight, uh, not fight back, but prevent being jammed by, let's say, um, opposition forces. So what, what happened is they used CDMA. So CDMA is great against narrowband jamming. And they did the calculation. If you had a wideband jammer, because that CDMA doesn't do well against wideband jamming, you need a radio connected to like a small nuclear power plant to effectively jam everything in like, you know, a CDMA band. Um, where else does this come up? Like wideband jammer versus narrowband jammer. Um, so for instance, in Iraq and Afghanistan, so what happened is uh, there, um, a lot of the roadside bombs, the IEDs, a lot of them are set off by, uh, for instance, like cell phones and other um, uh, wireless devices that are very similar to the frequencies used by US military forces. So, so what happens is you have a convoy, and what they initially did is they will just jam everything in sight. They will just like, like deny all. But here's the problem. So what this does is this also jams their own wireless equipment, their own radios. So what happens is you have the small convoy, and they do this by default. They just jam everything because they don't want IEDs going off everywhere. Then they get ambushed, and then it's like, OK, if we turn off the jammer so we can call for help, the IEDs go off. But if we don't turn off the jammer, we can't call for help. So it's like a catch-22. So they came up with a very interesting solution. So there's a number of solutions. You have a very intelligent uh, narrowband jammer that's like, are you an enemy signal or a friendly signal? And it, will, uh, it just takes a split second, and it will start jamming just the uh, adversary's signal, the insurgent signal. Um, but the problem is, it's got to be really fast, because the signal that will trigger the IED from going off is like really fast, right? Um, so they came up with an even sneakier way, which is like I thought was ingenious. And I think since then, they now came up with a, a better technique. So what happens is most of these IEDs are set off by uh, pay-as-you-go cell phones, right? You go, you pay 10 bucks, you get a phone number, they attach it to an ordinance that did not explode, and they set it off by calling the number, right? So what they did, on top of the Humvee, they put a base station. They put a cellular base station. And remember what I talked about a few lectures ago about going to the base station with the strongest signal power, right? So the handoff, 
what they did is they made sure that base station was the strongest base station in the area. So, all, so what happens is um, all those uh, IEDs lock onto that base station, and then what they did, I don't know how they did this, they kept that call in an endless loop, so no one's able to connect with it. Since then, I think uh, insurgents have caught on, but, and, and that was ingenious. It's like, use the cellular technology to, to, to keep that threat um, at, at bay. So, so that's why jamming, jamming is used in a lot of other applications, too. Like, for instance, um, like, you know, if, if you have, um, for instance, if you have radar, if you have any sort of enemy communications, or what was done in the Cold War, um, a lot of radio stations from the West, like, let's say, Western Europe, were jammed because they don't want Eastern, uh, Eastern Germans to listen to that. Because, oh, that's, that's anti-revolutionary or something like that. Right? That's why you have things like Voice of America, which is on a really low frequency. But they tried jamming that as well. All right? So jamming. So just an inside. So uh, in this case, the collision can be more than inten uh, in intentional. It could be totally unintentional. Yes? So, so you, could, you can up the ante. Um, that's one thing. There are several other things that you can do. So, you can do, so there's another type of uh, spread spectrum communication. So there's CDMA. There's something called frequency hopping. So what you do is every split second, you change center frequency, change center frequency, and you continuously do that. Like, for instance, Bluetooth does this. The, uh, the, U, the US standard, like France is different because they have different spectrum. Um, hops through 76 different frequencies in a random pattern, but it's, they call it not random, they call it pseudo-random. If you know the pattern, so you and the intended recipient, like it looks random to everyone else, so if you're trying to jam it, you're like all over the place. But to the desire, the, t the destination, the source, they're in sync with each other. Um, to up the ante in terms of transmit power, that's another form of attack. So let's say I want to, let's say you have a limited battery supply, like my cell phone. And let's say I'm being jammed, I up the ante, I transmit more, then you transmit more, and then what ends up happening is my battery life begins to decrease, right? So that would be also a form of attack. If I really want my, my opponent to get less and less battery life, I just draw it out and make them use up more power. So what you would do instead is you would try and move out of the way. So you would call this, um, LPD, LPI, so um, low probability of interception, low probability of detection. You try and hide and evade your adversary. Yes? Is the frequency hopping, um, that would is that what happens when you pair with a Bluetooth device, you're, you're synchronizing your... D they're agreeing on, like, this is the pattern we're going to use, this is the protocol, and then, and, and again, actually, Bluetooth is a great example. It's not meant also for intentional jamming, but what it's also meant for unintentional. So what, what happens is, if you hop, 76 different frequencies per cycle, maybe one time you actually get interfered with, or two times, with another Bluetooth device, with another wireless device. I can take the hit. I can lose 176 of my data. I will just retransmit. So, so that's the thing. So there's a trade-off between at, like, you know, um, how much I'm interfered with, uh, with respect to complexity and such. That's a great question. Yes, Princessa. The, yes, they let's say they're both on the same frequency, FI. So when they're on the so when they reach here, they actually will superimpose on each other, and it will just sound like gobbledygook. Okay, great question. Exactly, and and the radio cannot separate the two apart. That's the problem. Good. So this is so this thing with respect to collision is a very serious issue. And, and is the bane of all our existence uh, in the communications world. So what we do, okay, so let's look at unintentional. Maybe I should have, like, if anyone's interested, I can also talk about intentional jammers another class. Like, you know, because I can go on and on and on and on. Like, you know, because um, just as an aside, so what my research activity is all about, so I do something called cognitive radio. And so what cognitive radio does is it's a highly intelligent wireless device that evades, interferes, um, it tries to minimize interference. So your regular radio, like your RTL SDRs, is like, I'm going to be on this frequency, and I'm going to decode on this frequency. A cognitive radio will, will try and evade. It will, it will do whatever you program it to do, but it's going to do it without any humans in the loop. It will learn. 
right? So, and that's often used in things like Department of Defense or um, public safety or national security or surveillance and such. Okay. But that's a separate, like I could talk about this all day, as you can see. Um, but in the commercial world or just in general, um, this is a problem whether the interference is intentional or not. And so what we need to do is have some ground rules. Okay? So what happens is if we have one node, one transmitter, one receiver, totally easy, right? There's no chance of interference, at least man-made. Like if you have solar flare activity um, or natural lighting or whatever sort of electromagnetic interference, that's a separate thing. You know, there's going to be that anyway in our, in our universe. But if it's like one transmitter, one receiver, you're not going to have any problem with respect to um, interference from another radio. On the other hand, once you start having more than one radio, you automatically are opening yourself up to the possibility of interference if you're both trying to communicate to the same receiver. And what ends up happening is, um, in situations like this, um, because it comes down to essentially how much information you can get across in unit time and unit frequency, once you start having other folks, you've got to share frequency, you've got to share time, right? It's like, oh, it's now my term. It's almost like, you know, using the TV, right? Like, if I lived by myself, that TV set, I have 24 hours a day, right? Like, let's say I have my Roku, or, and I watch Netflix. Like, what, what is the total amount of time that I can spend watching TV? 24 hours. Once I have my sister or my wife, and she wants to watch Jane Eyre, and I still want to watch my History Channel documentary or something on something, um, what ends up happening is, okay, Jen, you get 12 hours, I get 12 hours. So I've just cut down the amount of information I receive by a factor of two. And the more users you have, and assume everyone is treated equally, you begin cutting up by the total number of users. So in this case, what is the time duration that I can watch TV? What do, what, what, what do we call that? It's a resource, right? So to me, access to information, I call it a resource. And that's actually, let me, th that's what we actually view access to the transmission medium. It's a resource. So there's an entire area of wireless communications. You're more than welcome to do a PhD in it. There's like tons of folks in this thing. We call it resource allocation. So what resource allocation is, is how we have different radios all try to talk with each other in a fair way such that their needs are satisfied. The amount of data that they receive per unit time and in order to minimize conflict and interference with each other. Okay? And resource could also imply things like how much battery is expended, right? The complexity of the receiver, latency. So resource is essentially all these physical parameters that are used in order to assess like how easy it is for us to get information from point A to point B. And then we have lots of points in this mess of a network. If you talk about cellular networks, resources are very regimented. And why is that? Cell phone company, right? So I'm not sure, I'm not going to ask how, many, how much people pay here for cell phones, okay? Because I like your service. But let's say you pay good money, right? $40, $50, $60 and up. If you're part of a family plan, I'm not sure if you contribute to your parents' uh, family plan or anything like that. But what ends up happening is you're paying money, right? And what happens if, let's say, you're really fed up with the service? You're going to go to the other guy, right? You're going to say, hey, Sprint. That's really cool. You're going to cover like my, my uh, what, what do you call it, termination fees? And you're going to get me new iPhone 6 whatever? Absolutely. But bye you know, company XYZ, right? So cell phone companies, they cannot even, they, they know that you will not pay for a wireless service that only gets half the data across because of collisions and this lack of coordination. So down to a T, down to the nanosecond, they're going to carve up everything for you and say, you're going to have this much resource in terms of time and bandwidth. Get the data across. And you, and you, and you, right? And that's done through TDMA, CDMA, and FDMA. The random access, that's that guy. That's Wi-Fi. I'm, I'm pointing at the Wi-Fi access point, sorry. So, no, that's that guy. No. So, Wi-Fi, how much are you paying for Wi-Fi? Uh, forget about the tuition for now. The, let's say, barring tuition, 
Let's say you go to Starbucks and you don't buy the coffee, right? You're just parked next to it. You're not actually in Starbucks, right? I'm not sure how many. Okay, I do have to ask this. How many people have sort of borrowed Wi-Fi at a coffee shop and not really bought anything? Say I. <laughs> okay, so I'm not alone. So, but it's free, right? And what happens? It, like the model is very different. Like for Wi-Fi, it's the second guy. It's the first come, first serve. I'm going to access it. Maybe you're going to access it. Maybe you're going to access it. And there's, there's, first of all, no kind of guarantee. And it's really first come, first serve. And it's, it's contention based. The more, and what happens when you have 50, 60, 100 people all with Wi-Fi trying to access one access point? Everything miraculously slows down. Because all of us are fighting for it. And there's no central resource management. It's like first come, first serve. And we're going to be talking about that later in this lecture. Yes? By first come, first serve, do you mean the first user who connects has the most bandwidth? Or is just in Let's, that second as you're all fighting? So I'm going to, I'm, OK, so I'm going to fast forward a little bit. But what happens is, let's say here's a channel. So let's say we look at Wi-Fi. So how does Wi-Fi look like? Channel 1, channel 6, and I think it's 11? OK. So what ends up happening is, so you have these three non-overlapping channels. So that's characteristic of Wi-Fi. So three non-overlapping channels. OK. And you keep, and you keep there each frequency. Yep. For yeah, yeah. So this is. 2.4 gigahertz to 2.5 gigahertz. And so what happens is, let's say there's user 1. So I'm going to say user 1 with a laptop. User 2 with a laptop. User 3. So what will happen if you have these guys, Okay, is you have your little wireless card, or you have wireless built in. And it'll say, OK, let's say wire, um, user 1 comes along and says, OK, I need Wi-Fi. Oh, OK, all channels are available. I'm just going to talk on channel 1. And begins communicating on it. And it's like, oh, it's still empty. I'm going to keep on transmitting. So you have all the bandwidth on channel 1 to communicate your information and receive information, download stuff, and the like. User 2 comes along and says, oh, it looks like 1 is really occupied, but 6 is totally available, and does that. And then user 3, OK, 1 and 6 are used a lot, but channel 11 seems to be unoccupied and accesses that. But then what happens is you have user number 4. And so user 4 also wants access. So what will happen is uh, user 4 is going to So this is actually something from the. the on lecture 13. So it's called carrier sense, multiple access, and it's with collision avoidance. So CSMA, CA. And what it's going to do, it's going to say, oh, it's occupied. I'm going to back off a random amount of time. And then it's going to listen a little bit later. Oh, it's available, and jumps right in. And then let's say radio 3 goes back to channel 11. Oh, shoot. OK, it's occupied. I'm going to back off a random amount of time. So what, what ends up happening is your Wi-Fi um, does not transmit in a constant stream. It uh, transmits in blocks and blocks and blocks and blocks. So what, et what ends up happening is uh, these radios, whenever there's an opening, jumps in. right? And then if there's another radio, comes back and sees it's occupied, it needs to back off until it's available, and then it jumps in. Yes? So it looks like we're actually like TDMA, where like you have like patch blocks and like. Almost. So, l l so l let me actually explain. So, so this is. So this is completely contention-based. TDMA is sort of that lockstep type of resource allocation. So what do I mean by that? So TDMA, CDMA, and, and FDMA. So TDMA, what you've got, so let's say we look at one frequency. So F equals F1. TDMA. The way it's done in a cellular network for that one channel, F1, is, OK, this is going to be Bob's okay, for that duration, 0 to T1. Then this is going to be Jen's. 
from T1 to T2. And it's, let's, say, let's assume that they're the same duration. Let's say this is Paul's. And that's T2 to T3. Randy's, T3 to T4. And then we go back to Bob. And we repeat this pattern. So what happens is you have a centralized entity in this case. In this case, you're a service provider for a cellular service that says, this time duration, yours. This time duration, yours. This time duration, yours. And then it rotates through again and again and again. So it's very different than that where everybody's kind of saying, oh, is, is it available now? Here, everybody's synced up. Every cell phone is synced up with, in this case, the access point, the base station. And it says, I know what time I'm going to transmit on. And it gets more complicated in, in a minute. Yep. Is that more energy efficient because you're not waiting around to link up? It's not only more energy efficient, it's also more bandwidth efficient. You get more data across this way than you would, uh, let's say, with like Wi-Fi. If you have a lot of collisions and such, you're, you're just wasting your time backing off all the time. Here, it's like you're guaranteed this sliver of time, uh, time slice to transmit your information. On the other hand, with the frequency, okay, so, so that's time. Let's, and so this is TDMA. FDMA, frequency division multiple access, what you've got is, let's say across time, that's all yours. So let's say this is all Bob's. Okay? But if you look now from a frequency perspective, so F, you take, let's say, that original channel, that F1, and you slice it up. So now what you've got on that one channel, you now have multiple subchannels. You've got Bob, Jen, Paul, Randy, Let's put in Debbie. Debbie, Alex, Camden. Okay? So now what you've got is you now have uh, one seventh the bandwidth, but you're allocated that entire time duration for your transmission. So what happens is instead of every time, like every time instant, it's a different user, different user, different user, different user, rotate, now it's I'm constantly transmitting over time, but I have much less bandwidth to transmit across. So I get less information across in one of these slivers of frequency, right? I get much less. Because if you look here, this TDMA setup, the bandwidth is this. And remember what I said, like the width of in the frequency domain. So that's frequency. That's frequency. The width indicates how much data you're getting across unit time. So in TDMA, each one of those time slivers has a lot of information going across in each one of those instances. In FDMA, you have all the time you want, but you're getting a lot less information across. Right? And then, of course, there's the last guy, CDMA. And the way CDMA works is across time, This is your, well, this is Bob's signal. This is Randy's. This is Jen's. And so on. And then, and so that's time. And then in frequency, same thing. What happens is you're transmitting across time and frequency across all frequency and across all time, but you're transmitting a very, very weak signal. It's spread it across all that band and across time, and you're layered with everyone else. And the way to decode your signal, the way you pull your signal out of the mess, is you have that spreading code that I talked about before. So your spreading code is the, the key to extract your signal and throw away the rest. And there's some fancy mathematics behind it, which we won't talk about. But that's what you have in your 3G and 4G phones. OK? Now, I just wanted to add something. You can combine TDMA, FDMA, and or CDMA together. So let me give you a little bit of insight of the latest and greatest. 
And it's called, like with LTE and LTA. So the way it works is that between, let's say, your base station and your mobile, your mobile user, what you've got is something called resource blocks. And it looks like this. Actually put users. And what you've got essentially is this humongous grid. You know, so this, this is frequency, and this is time. What this pattern does, let's say it's from base station to all the mobile users. This, 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 and this. These are your resource blocks. That might be allocated to mobile user one. This guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, maybe him and him and him, those will be allocated to mobile user two. And what ends up happening is, we call this entire length, we call it a resource frame. Resource frame. Um, these are called resource blocks. Okay. And there's everything in between. And so this is used in 4G communications. So it's this grid pattern, and the allocations for every user is on a time and frequency basis. And so you know that your entire LTE, LTA network is, like, is down to like these tiny little frequency time blocks all the time. And if you think I'm crazy, or more crazy, check this out. So do a search. Do a Google search. Boop. And you do LTE resource block. And you'll find a gajillion diagrams. Yeah, here we go. So this is just one example. So what happens is you, um, each, one of these, you know, each one of these slots is 0.5 millimeter, uh, milliseconds uh, long. You, this is across 180 kilohertz, each one of these increments. You have a bunch of rows. They're 10 milliseconds in duration. So you have basically 20 resource blocks in time that form a single resource frame. And what ends up happening is this is how LTE, it's carving down your resources, time frequency resources, down to these uh, what is it? 0.5 millisecond blocks by 180 kilohertz wide blocks all the time. So it is maxing out. It's going to handle like hundreds of users within a single cell site. So that's the future. No longer are we having these long durations. Everything's cut down into things like this. And there's a bunch of these cool diagrams. This one's actually, I don't like this diagram. This one's actually better. I, I've seen this one before. Oh, come on. Yeah, here we go. So graphically, what you've got is each one of these little bumps or these little squares is one part of your wireless communications. All right. I digress. So, so that's, those are those three guys in action. Yes? One more cell phone question. Yeah. If it, but if it's totally off topic. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, so I know iPhones, at least, like, they tell you, they ask you to, like, check sometimes whether your iPhone is GSM or CDMA. Yeah. We talked about GSM as being part of 2G. Or 2.5G. Oh, well, it depends. If it's but it's, I mean, it still can be a modern iPhone that's on. The, is it just that some areas haven't So that's a great. So it's, what, what we call that is we call it legacy. So there's still infrastructure in the United States that supports it and is a little bit more robust and stuff. So in worst comes to worst, if let's say you're in Vermont, so this happens to me every time I went up to Montreal to see my parents and such, until lately, but Vermont for the most part, or northern New Hampshire. They probably rolled out to 2.5G, but they didn't have 3G or even 4G out there so yet. it's just older technology. It's not like... Exactly. Because, because to roll out that type of technology is a big investment. So they usually focus on major population centers like New York, Los Angeles, Philly, Houston, Chicago. And then they will eventually roll it out until like the entire coverage map is is covered, right? But that's why it's just it's just like they're uh, until they feel like there's a market value, like you know there's a right, need right. value add. Yeah, that's a great question. Cool. Okay. 
So now with Aloha and Slot Aloha. So this is, we're not going to talk about Wi-Fi and how this is related yet because CSMA, CSMA, CD. So CD is collision detection. Do you know that there's a collision? And CA is collision avoidance. But CSMA we'll talk about next lecture. But what we're going to look at is this thing about um, random access protocols, such as Slot Aloha. And what Slot Aloha is, again, there's a lot of math. So let's, let's actually just go to drawing. I'm a drawing person today. I don't know why. <laughs> and for everyone else that's not here, they're missing out. <sighs> so what happens is, so let's say there's pure Aloha. That's a cool name. Aloha. Ah! I hate when that happens. So what happens is uh, pure aloha is when you have uncoordinated users competing for the use of a single channel. So what you would have is, let's say you have user A, B, C, D, and E. Okay? And suppose this guy, A, transmits a few packets, right? or a frame, B sends a couple, C sends a few, D has one, and E has one as well. The way, the way Aloha works, okay, the frames, these frames are transmitted at arbitrary Times. Now what happens is, let's, let's look to see if there's any collisions. Aha, uh -huh. we have a collision here, we have a collision there, we don't have a collision there, or there, or there, or there. So wherever there's a collision, so I'm just going to make this look like a collision. So collision, collision, any other collisions? Yeah, that's a collision, fine. That's a collision. B doesn't, so what happens is whenever there's a collision, the, is this, I'm sorry, uses across the y-axis? Yes. So, what do we see across the axis? So this time? is across time. Time, okay. Time, perfect. But what happens is this is the traffic pattern for every user. So let's say at this time instant, at this time instant, user A and user B are transmitting. They both want information out, and they have some overlap. One signal has, one frame has not finished transmitting, and another one's starting to transmit. <laughs> Collision. It's all garbled. It's useless. Throw away the data. Anytime you have two guys transmitting at the same time or more, like here, like here, like here, garbage, and you have to retransmit it some other time. Right? Slotted Aloha. Big difference, you are constrained to be within a time instant. And the way that's accomplished is there's um, uh, something like a, a little peep or a little timing signal at the beginning of every, um, what you call it, slot. So what you've got is, again, let's say you have users A, B, C, D. But what happens is you have these time slots. And you can only transmit at the beginning of every time slot. And all the frames are the same width. So A will be here. Let's say B will be here. D will be here. C will be here. E will be here. Oh, but look, A is also transmitting at the same time. Collision, both are garbage. We're going to have to retransmit these two guys, right? And what happens is how the, the timing at which each one of these guys retransmit is random. So they don't retransmit at the same time because then they collide at the same time, right? So let's say A will transmit five seconds from now, C will transmit 10 seconds from now. Totally random numbers. So this is actually what you'll see in things like Wi-Fi and other types of networks where they don't have centralized resource mapping, okay, and control. All right, so with that, um, have a great weekend, and uh, that is lecture 12.